Welcome to Home Ties, a podcast about staying connected to home, no matter where you are. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily those of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Some cultures place a high value on giving and receiving respect, especially to the elderly. In Malawi, it's just good manners to greet people by name, even if it means you take an extra minute or two to greet each and every individual in a large group of people. If you neglect to greet somebody, Verbally, it's more than bad manners. It's a slap in the face. Now, nobody tells you about these cultural differences ahead of time. You just have to find your own way forward. It's kind of like asking for directions in Africa. You know, there's not a whole lot of signs to show you where you need to go. It's not easy to navigate your way along unmarked dirt roads, to go to villages that have no signs or names in remote areas. If you stop by the side of a road and ask somebody how you can get to a certain village, it's likely they'll give you direction, even though they may have absolutely no idea where you need to go. That happened to me. On the way to a a women's meeting, I asked for directions, and we just ended up going in exactly the opposite direction. And with each person we stopped to ask for directions, we kept getting further and further away from our destination. And that's because people don't want to make you feel bad. That's because people tell you what they think you want to hear. In a culture which values not putting people on the spot, you don't want to admit you don't know. Well, what about using Google Maps? Well, (laughs) Google Maps don't always reflect the reality on the ground. Sometimes the uh, satellite images don't match up with what roads are drawn on the page. Or maybe it's an old image. Google Maps doesn't show you where a flood has washed out the bridge or where the rains have turned the road to quicksand. You know, I found it's much better and much more certain that you'll get to your destination if you pick up a hitchhiker from the place that you're trying to go and have him give you turn-by-turn directions, even if it means he goes completely out of his way. They're happy to do it for you because, again, they want to accommodate you. I don't think it's... It's no accident that there's a lack of good signage. The lack of signage isn't accidental. You don't want to draw unwanted attention from either thieves or the tax revenue authorities. But maybe it's even more than that. If you don't know how to get somewhere, maybe you have no business going there in the first place. This all gets to the cultural difference of context. The idea of context is how much information do people assume that you know? Now, in Western cultures, we say our low context. In other words, we assume that nobody knows anything. So we try to make things as user-friendly as possible. We provide detailed step-by-step directions with screenshots and and video presentations. And you do everything possible so that nobody feels left out, that everybody is able to actively participate because they know what the rules are. They know how the game is played. African culture, on the other hand, is what you'd call high context. And the assumption is that You already know everything, so there's no need to explain the obvious. And 
in the process make your lack of understanding painfully obvious to everyone. So let's talk about this for a minute and show how the difference between high context and low context is expressed in a church setting. Um, in the United States, church websites are built for anyone. Directions and the time of service are very clearly stated on the front page of the, of the website. Contact information is there, the email, phone number of the pastor. There are samples of uh, sermons that have been presented. There's a detailed explanation of what you can expect in a service and even what clothes are appropriate to wear. And so anybody, even if they've never been to a Lutheran church service before, can go and visit that worship service and feel like they fit in. Now in Malawi, you visit a church not because you found it on a website, but because a friend or a relative personally invited you. At the conclusion of the service, you are asked to stand up, to state your name, and where you're from. In the United States, you can imagine if people did that to visitors, some people might think that's a little creepy and an invasion of privacy. But here in Malawi, it's a way that the group can formally give honor to the visitors. And I think it's true that in both the United States and in uh, Malawi, people want to feel like they belong. In the United States, we give the visitors the information they need so that they can figure out what's going on by themselves. In Malawi, you avoid drawing attention to the information that visitors don't know. And there's very few directions that are offered during the service. I can tell you, uh, my wife and I have visited uh, churches in remote areas any number of times here in Africa, and we are always offered a place to sit in the very front row of church. It's a place of honor, to be sure, but it also assures that it's a place where no one else in that congregation has to come near to us and interact with us, which is a way of them preserving their own comfort level, I imagine. And I, I wonder how many times I have seen this scene replayed in church buildings all across America when you have people who are obvious newcomers sitting in a corner by themselves. And in the meantime, I've seen my members talking in huddles by themselves, leaving that couple all to themselves. I mean, even on Easter Sunday, people were unwilling to go up to strangers and greet them. Maybe you recall the Apostle Paul and his visit to the city of Athens in Acts chapter 17. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. The ancient Greeks were infatuated with novelty. In that way, they're very similar to Americans. The Greeks would give anybody an open mic. So when Paul began preaching about the resurrection of the dead in Athens, he must have sounded like an alien from another planet. After all, who would want their pure mind to be stuck back inside a filthy, rotting body of flesh? Well, we can thank Plato for planting that idea in people's minds. <laughs> And yet, in spite of the strangeness of this teaching of the resurrection, these Athenians were curious to hear more 
from this Jewish rabbi. Maybe if for no other reason than to gossip about him and his strange message after he left their city. The fact that the Athenians were open to listen made them much different from the Jews who would not give him a fair listening. Now, these days, it seems like there are two alternate universes where people see the same events and interpret them according to different realities. This isn't just due to a difference of politics. There's a reason why Christians and non-believers have difficulty understanding each other. The gospel is foolishness and babbling to unbelievers without God's Spirit. That means no matter how well you lay out your church's website or your sanctuary or your worship folder, the unconverted will not understand the gospel message of free salvation by grace alone through faith alone. If you don't have the action of God's Spirit working in your heart, you will remain an outsider to God's kingdom. But the gospel is the power of God for salvation of both Jews and Greeks, Democrats and Republicans, Westerners and Easterners. Jesus came to expose humanity's universal and absolute helplessness to save ourselves from God's punishment. He also came to reveal the tender-hearted love of his Father, who accepted his Son's death on a cross in exchange for our sins. Now, I know it's uncomfortable when it seems like everybody in a group is at ease and having fun, and you're sitting on the outside, scratching your head, trying to figure out what's going on. I imagine there are some people out there trying to figure out what makes Christians act the way they do. And of course, they may jump to the wrong conclusions. But because of Jesus, we are no longer outsiders. Because of Jesus, we belong, and we know the inside story. And any discomfort or embarrassment that we might cause either ourselves or someone else by pointing out the right path to take is a small price to pay so that someone else might find their way home. The next time on Home Ties, it's a popular story in the United States. The person who rises above the circumstances of their birth to become the first college-educated member of their family. Or the nonconformist who creates something no one had ever dreamed possible. Individualism is deeply embedded in American culture. but. In other cultures, loyalty to the group comes first, and conformity to traditional values is rewarded. As the Japanese proverb says, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. We'll see you next time.